Without further ado, I'd like to introduce a close friend of mine. I call him the Rebbe of CES. If you've ever gone to CES in Las Vegas, he's been there before all of us even knew, knew what CES is. But he'll introduce the rest of our panel, my close friend, Shelley Palmer. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. good evening. That's so much better when everybody like does that. That's really good. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Joseph. That was uh, a lovely introduction. And I, it's such a pleasure to be here. I was, um, I didn't know anything about the organization until a few weeks back when Joseph sent me a note. And the more I learned about it, the more it made me smile. Just really extraordinary. We're going to have an interesting panel in a moment. <clears throat> it's going to be uh, a Socratic discussion about life, liberty, and the pursuit of entrepreneurship. Uh, before I bring the panel up, which I will do in just a minute, I'd like to level set for a second. And uh, what we'll do after this little few minutes of level setting is bring the panel up. Each panelist will self-introduce, make a short statement, and then we're going to go at it like good Jews. And we'll see how it happens. We'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> how many of you were at CES this year? How many of you know it, don't know what CES is? All right, hmm. goes like this. The Consumer Electronics Show is brought to you by the Consumer Electronics Association, which recently renamed themselves the Consumer Technology Association, figuring that consumer electronics were no longer meaningful. They have expanded to a couple of million square feet with 20,000 new product announcements and about 3,500 exhibitors, and they've taken over the entire city of Las Vegas, sort of like locusts. Um, it's just horrifyingly large. But there's an interesting pavilion under the Sands Convention Center that they call Eureka Park that has grown so dramatically over the last few years that they needed to give it a million square feet of exhibit space. And there were 500 basically 10 by 10 booths down there, each of them from a startup. Now there was something unique and interesting about these startups. Most of the people in those environments, in these little 10 by 10 booths, had spent more money buying their plane tickets to Vegas, getting their hotel rooms, and paying CES than they spent to start their companies. That is really important. Because if you will it to happen in 2016, it's going to happen. So ideas have never been cheaper and more useless. Execution's never been more uh, cheaper and more valuable, and a combination of a great idea and great execution, as always, is the key to everything. Now, as you walk through these 500 exhibits, you got to see a very wide spectrum of people who had a lot of passion and belief and not a whole lot of brains, and a lot of brains and technique and not a lot of passion, and everything in the middle. And I don't, I don't think that there's any one right formula. I don't think you can say that there is special alchemy that makes somebody a successful entrepreneur. Uh, there are plenty of aphorisms and all kinds of Yoda-like wisdom, uh, a lot of Ann Landers kind of uh, soundbite sociology I could give you about you know, inspiration and perspiration. At the end of the day, we're living in an accelerated time. Today is the slowest pace of change you will ever experience for the rest of your life. We are in a curve of technological advancement that is now a step function going straight up. Somebody, if you think of how to do it cheaper, somebody is going to figure out how to do it cheaper than you figured out how to do it. If you figured out how to do it faster, somebody's going to figure out how to do it faster than you figured out how to do it. The question isn't about technique as much as it is about a team execution. We are definitely in a time when we're betting the jockeys, not the horses. And so to every person who's in this room that is dreaming an entrepreneurial dream, Make sure you're concentrating on the only thing that you have that no one else in the world possibly can have, and that's your Yiddish cup. It's yours. It's your personal understanding. It's what you know. It's your domain expertise. Because everything else is commoditized. I can buy better machine learning than, than anybody else. I can buy cheaper machine learning. I can buy better servers. I can buy access to better servers. I can buy math. I can buy computer science. I can't buy passion and I can't buy your special subject matter knowledge, your special um, internal flame that says, I'm gonna make this happen. And willing something to be in 2016 is the only way stuff will ever come to be. And with that sort of level set about the times in which we live and the ability, fun with JSON strings, and if you don't know what that is, look it up. Uh, let's bring up the panel and let's start to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship in 2016 and how to globalize your entrepreneurial idea. Gentlemen, come on up and join me. So.
So, Howard, if you just start the ball rolling by picking up. Great. So, Howard, if you'd. Um, uh, yeah, this looks. This looks. Yeah, and also, I don't think you need that part yeah, of it. That, that would be bad. You don't need that. So, this is a little better. Uh, the power switches are always useful. Uh, so, I'm Howard Morgan. I am a founding partner of First Round Capital, an early stage venture capital fund. It started in 2005, that has done about 350 investments, uh, ranging from. Uh, uh, ranging from things like Uber, which has done pretty well for us, uh, to uh, a lot of e-commerce startups, which we do less of today, uh, to high-tech things like MemSQL, high-speed databases. And uh, before, before I started first round, I was a, a you know, college professor for uh, 14 years at Cornell and Caltech and Penn. And after that, I started Renaissance with Jim Simon. So I've so been involved in quantitative investments. Uh, and... Um, and I've gotten involved uh, with a number of causes, including the Jewish Children's Museum and Chabad on Campus, where I'm on the board. Uh, and I really try to support entrepreneurship wherever I can. Eric. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Eric Serkin. Um, I just arrived today from California. Um, I'm here from Israel I, on a three-week trip. Um, I have a PhD out in chemical physics out of Berkeley. And then after my degree, I went and taught in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem their chemistry department for two years, then went back to the Valley, where I started working at Xerox Park in the early early 80s, during what they call the golden era, when virtually everything you know today was invented. Laser printing, Ethernet, I worked in the first Ethernet implementation in the world, and uh, many other things. My office mate was the invented laser printer, and two doors down from me were John Warnock and Chuck Geschke, the founders of Adobe. And so I lived in the Valley for over 30 years, and. Uh, after four years at Xerox, went to my first startup, which was called Surround Corporation. I was employee seven. It went public after about uh, nine years, and uh, all I left after six, and uh, in the chip industry. And then I changed from the chip industry to the systems and networking industry. In, the, in, be in between, I was in the color printing industry. When I went back, to the went back to Xerox, I spent eight years at Apple. I was an executive at Apple. Uh, then it was called Apple Computer. Now it's called Apple. And uh, worked in uh, mostly managing engineering organizations there. And then after Apple, I uh, went to a startup in the digital watermarking space. So we sold our technology to a Japanese company that used it in the DVD standard for rights management. And then I was uh, drafted by some venture capital firms I know in the Valley to run engineering at one of the first internet companies called Internet Travel Network. We were the first to do travel booking. And long before Travelocity and Expedia, we took the company public a year after I got there. And then we were purchased for a billion dollars by Sabre Holdings in 2000. And uh, I was there for a couple of years and then let, took a couple years off and started up a company of my own that, uh, in the mobile software space that we shut down after two years because we couldn't monetize it. So there are successes and failures in all of our lives, and that was one of my failures. And, but um, good entrepreneurs pick up the ball and they move forward. And then um, I was then drafted by another venture capital firm to run engineering at a solar energy company. Uh, and then after that, I. I made uh, my move to Jerusalem, the Yerakodesh. And I live in Jerusalem, been there for five and a half years. I, ma I work about three days a week in Tel Aviv. And I'll just mention one thing about um, what I'm doing. I work, I'm now working on both sides of the, the fence, if you will. I work with a venture capital firm in Tel Aviv, a small one called Maverick Ventures, and I help them screen companies and evaluate them all from a technology perspective and help manage them afterwards. I've also started my own company up while, while, while in Israel. and. Um, in reference to what someone said earlier about the the, um, uh, the message from Ramban, um, I'm very proud that the Maverick Ventures uh, d dedicates 2% of its um, earnings to a charity called Hatsala. If you've been in Israel, you're familiar with this organization. We're all, all the partners were all very active in Hatsala in one form or another. And I also sit on the board of the Lone Soldier Center in honor of Michael Levine that helps Lone Soldiers not only from foreign countries, but they're about half Lone Soldiers are actually Israelis. and. Uh, more we'll elaborate more about that perhaps later. Okay. My name is Chaim Pekarski. I company is called like this. Doesn't work. No, it's right. good. Um, CNA Marketing. Uh, I've been in business about twenty years. About thirteen years ago, I partnered up with my uh, partner, who was my competition. 
And if you've ever purchased, if you purchase stuff on Amazon on a regular basis, chances are um, I've made money on you. <laughs> so um, I sell on Amazon, eBay, make a lot of stuff. Some things that people need, some things that people don't need, but they buy it anyway. All right. And on that note, let's see. A Socratic debate has to start with a Socratic premise. So Apple had a record quarter. In fact, until Alphabet's earnings were announced today, it was the highest grossing quarter in American history. But today, Alphabet, uh, which is Google and other bets, um, beat them. <clears throat> Best strategy for an entrepreneur right now, figure out how you're going to sell to Apple or Google, uh, Apple or Google immediately. Discuss. Apple or Google or Facebook uh, or Amazon, actually, are the people you have to sell to. Gang of four. The gang of four. They dominate everything. Um, I think that's not necessarily the best strategy. Uh, I don't think so either, but I just wanted to say something <laughs> I ridiculous. So, well, so uh, I'll, 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 the, 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 the counter to that is... Uh, first of all, they have tr they'll put too much price pressure on you because if most of your business is selling to those big guys, uh, they have they can control you, and they also can buy you whenever they want. So and sometimes they pay well, sometimes they don't. Uh, you really have to develop your own business with uh, hopefully a lot of customers. There are companies that uh, do well with Amazon. The the company that sold them the robotics uh, stuff then got bought for them by bought for the, from them from the billion dollars. But unless you're providing something that they're really desperately need, but you're just competing with other people providing the same services or products, uh, they're not necessarily the best customers. Uh, app, look at Apple does so much in China, and they beat the margins really down for those people. They provide giant volumes, but uh, I don't think that's the strategy. Um, I don't, having worked at Apple, I, I, can, I can only agree with them 100%. I don't think I have anything to add. Um, they're very difficult companies to sell to, and uh, they they will understand your margins better than you will, and they'll squeeze you every penny you've got, and they'll make it very difficult for you to conduct business overall, unless you've gotten large by selling to other people first, and then come to them. That's a strategy that can work. Hi, any thoughts? If you're not selling on Amazon or to the big boys like Walmart, you're probably not in business. So yes, you do need those people, um, but what <coughs> you said was very correct. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you're doing all your business just on Amazon or just to a big retailer, you're putting yourself, you may be doing very well, but you're putting yourself in a very exposed position. So you really need to build yourself up slowly where they need you just as much as you need them. Frustratingly, the month of January saw no IPO at all. No tech IPOs happen in the month of January. So if I can't sell to the gang of four because they're going to bleed me dry and I can't go public because clearly Wall Street hates me now, what do I do? Discuss. <laughs> well, first of all, if, you get, if you're getting to the point where you, in the old days, would have done an IPO, uh, which means in the old days you did an IPO at $50 million in sales. Now, if you don't have a couple hundred million, uh, most of the bankers don't want to talk to you. Uh, that's the result of a, a horrible miscalculation on the part of the regulators uh, called decimal pricing, where in the, it was a nice old game. Sit, you traded stocks, they traded in eighths. There was 12 cents a share to share between the brokers, so they wanted to trade more shares. And they used that money that they made to do research and to help small companies. Now they get a tenth of a cent to share, there's no money to share, and so they don't care about small companies. So if you're a small company that you can't go public, and th this was the first month there were no IPOs, which was pretty dramatic. Yeah, very dramatic. Uh, very dramatic. We, we have uh, 350 companies. We have had a bunch of exits. But out of that, we've had three IPOs, uh, maybe four, uh, and we have for one that's merged. And almost all of our other exits, 70 of them, have been M&A activities, mergers into companies. And that is what you should expect as an exit if you're an investor. If you're an entrepreneur and you want to grow your company, you want to grow it to as large as you can. But you may sometimes get to a point where you'll be approached by other people. And so you want your company to be bought. You don't want to sell it. And the IPO, which was the traditional way to do that, is very hard. So now if you want to sell it, there's private equity players. But mostly there's your competitors or coopetition is the word people use. Your people you cooperate and compete with and you know align with some of them. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is a sad state 
what's happened to the IPO market. It's a little crazy. That, that subtlety, by the way, is not subtle, right? You want to be bought. You do not want to sell. Selling right now, it's all bad in every way that you can describe bad. Eric, you have a position? Well, yeah, I understand the differentiation you're making between selling and, 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 um, and not, but um, I would take a slightly different tact, and this is something I learned for many years in the Valley. This is all about creating value. It's not about creating an exit. Investors want to see an exit. You're the entrepreneur. Your job is, is regardless of the investors you take on, is to create value. And if you're creating value and you find the market that's willing to pay for that value, you've got a business. And hopefully you figured out a way to make money. And if you're making money and your business is growing, then going public or getting bought, it's a sideshow. It's irrelevant to your overall strategy of, of what you want to become and what you want to be. So um, don't focus on the exits. Don't focus on getting bought or, or whatever terminology you want to use. Focus on creating a truly great company that creates a service or products that people need and they want to buy. And that is what it's all about. Wow. Couldn't have said that better. Just, just let me add for, uh, to that. I second that. When we see a slide in, in, the, in, the, in the deck with first, ra first stage companies are presenting that talks about the exits, it turns us off completely. So you know, we, we want them to be building a great company, not worrying about the exit. One of the, uh, Jaime, did you want to bring? I wouldn't suggest what that. What Eric said was very true. Hmm? Um, you should run your company like you're going to sell it from day one. How would this company be sellable? Don't sell it. Run it, build it, milk it, and build it again and again and again. If someone comes knocking on your door, and that could happen, and says, I want your company because there's something that you do that we can't do ourselves fast enough or cheaper than buying your company, we'll buy you. But build your company in such a way that it is sellable, it is marketable, and even if you never sell it, it'll be a very successful company. And the reason is, is because if you're just doing something that everybody else is doing, then you're not really creating value. You may be generating cash, you may be generating profits temporarily, or for the long term, but if you don't have any, there's no value proposition, there's nothing that you do that's different, that's better, that's more efficient, that's actually creating value in the company, intangible value, then you should change your business, change your strategy, because then you're actually building some real value in the company. Good advice. All right, I've been given two texts. I don't like that question. I like this one. Okay, so at CES this year, one of the, the big story, the buzz story, was about virtual reality. Uh, everybody who know what virtual reality is, yes, you've all seen Oculus Rift and you understand what Samsung Galaxy VR is. Good. So <clears throat> the question is, for our esteemed panel, how do you think virtual reality will impact shopping experiences online? Not for a while. <laughs> Not for quite a while, I think. I mean, you know, we've seen demonstrations of walking around virtual stores and picking up products. Uh, it'll, it'll have an impact, but it's the same way that people thought 3D was going to make a big impact when you could rotate models and pictures in 3D on, on sales. And we had a company in the 90s that uh, Amazon used their technology to let you spin the, the things in 3D. Virtual reality gets you further along that line. Uh, I, don't, I think for the next few years, very, very little. Well, I would agree. I don't think I think virtual reality has got a way to go before it goes mainstream and people really start uh, uh, using it. But there's something called augmented reality, and that's here, that's now, that's real. And there are commercial applications that are being deployed, and people are buying it and using it. I'll give you one, uh, maybe a couple examples of firms that came through the VC office I work with in Tel Aviv. One was a company up in the Haifa area that does augmented reality for furniture. So if you have a piece of furniture that you like, you go into a store, and they're actually they sign contracts with I think, three major furniture chains here in the US. You can select that piece of furniture, and if you've taken a series of photographs properly taken in your living room, for example, you can place that piece of furniture exactly where you think you want it, and you can see how it looks in respect to the rest of the furniture. That's a real application with real commercial, has real value to end users, and people are using it and buying it. And there are other uh, examples of augmented reality in the landscaping industry and, and, and many other things. And those things are here. They're real today, and people are using and buying them. Microsoft has a technology. If you haven't seen it, it's called the HoloLens, and it's an AR technology. AR, you can 
immediately see a, a hundred different billion dollar businesses. Uh, a doctor would put on a pair of uh, augmented reality glasses, walk into a, a hospital room and see the patient's vital signs right over the patient, walk into a ward or a uh, NICU and every baby's bassinet you look in, you see 100% of the right is a heads up display. The the technology is, uh, Sony's got it out there right now. It's pretty spectacular. Um, just my own take on VR, which you can go to ShellyPalmer.com and read about all to your heart's content. Um, it's really early days. It's spectacular for gaming. The Oculus Rift gaming demos will stop your heart. For vocational training, it's off the hook. And for when it comes to uh, everything else, narrative storytelling and the like, virtual reality, it's super early days. Augmented reality is a much closer technology. So I love these two questions. These are two out outstanding questions. I don't know which one to do first. They're both great. Um, here's the first one. <coughs> How do you market a Yiddish cup when competing with MBAs and other certifications that attract VCs? Take one Yiddish cup over 10 MBAs any day. Yeah. But. What he said. But. But. <laughs> on the other hand. Give me 10 MBAs with Yiddish cup. Yeah. <laughs> one has nothing to do with the other. There are people who are trained. I have people who have PhDs and degrees up to the, you know, that work for me. And their expertise is learned. It's not something that I could just open up a book and learn it. There is a place for PhDs and MBAs and all of that. And there's a very, very strong need for it. And then you need someone with a Yiddish cup to run the business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a slightly different take. I, 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 really? <laughs> yeah, go. Uh, no, no. <laughs> so, Stay with me, uh, please. <laughs> um, the... I believe that getting an MBA is not about what you learn, about who, but, but it's about who you meet. You go to the right MBA program at the right school, whether it's Harvard Business School or Stanford or the Kellogg at Northwestern, this is more about the people you meet, the faculty you meet, and the context you meet at these places that benefit your businesses or whatever you decide to start later in your, your career that benefit you more than what you learn. I would, I would offer to you that most of what you learn in MBA program, with your Yiddish cup, you can learn on your own at home reading the right books at the right at your own pace, and you can learn pretty much all of it on your own. So that's my take on that. Can I disagree with you? Yeah. Well, actually, I agree with you, yeah. but <laughs> there, are, there are certain disciplines that are very hard to learn on your own, whether they're engineering yeah. or just there are certain... No, no we talk about, we talk about business talking about, Yeah. Oh, talking about business school? No, yeah, MBA. MBA. Yeah. MBA. Yeah. B, yeah, bus B school? Yeah. B school, Waste you can learn off of YouTube. Waste the time. No, we do agree. Right, but I, I will say, so first round did a study of the first 10 years of our investments and what factors performed better than other factors in, in, how, in how the companies did from an investment point of view. And we found a bunch of interesting things. One thing we found was that companies that had a female co-founder did 60% better than companies that were all male founders. Uh, the little, little uh, got, got a lot of press, but it was quite interesting. But the other thing we found was that companies that had one of the founders from one of the top colleges of the kind that Eric mentioned uh, also did better, not quite, not 60% better, I forget what the number was, 20 or something percent better, mainly because of the network they built, not the knowledge they built. Uh, but the fact is we've done companies where the founders have not even gone to college. I mean, and forget about the guys who dropped out of college because there's only three of them. There's, there's Zuckerberg, there's Gates, and there's Dell. After that, oh, the, the, Steve Jobs. and Steve Jobs, so four. But, so uh, four out of four, it's pretty decent, Howard. Four, four, clearly the messages don't go to school. No, right. So and as Bill Gurley said, uh, says, he says, okay, now, now show me the next thousand. Right. Right, and right. the next thousand aren't there. So going to school does, does, have, does pay its dividends. Some of it through the knowledge, particularly if it's computer science uh, you know, details or engineering details or accounting or finance details. You don't see a lot of accountants at Deloitte who haven't gone to college, even though you can learn accounting without going to college. But... The network is who you're going to hire from. And that's where the Goyesha Cup helps, too. The <laughs> Goyesha Cup. The Yiddish <laughs> Cup helps, too. Because the Yiddish Cup says, who do I meet in shul? I know fr who's a friend of a friend of a friend that knows somebody who might be useful. It's building that network that gets you the right people in your company 
That's the most important thing. I have a slightly different take on, on all of this, actually. And I, I, the question is interestingly worded. It says, how do you market a Yiddish Cup when competing with MBAs and other certifications to attract VCs? I'd argue the following. Everybody's job is exactly the same on this planet. Every single person's job in this room is the same. It's to translate the value of your intellectual property into wealth. Nobody here is lifting boxes for a living. Everybody here is using their brain, and they're either renting it out to someone else, or you're using it to actually generate your own cash. And so a Yiddish cup, in my, the, my definition thereof, the ability to understand who you are and the world around you in a way that others don't see, that's part and parcel to translating the value of your intellectual property into wealth. And you have to make the decisions. I'm going to use, uh, I have to clean this up in some way, but if you built the Death Star, you have a choice. You can A, rent it out, or B, go blow up some planets. I usually say something else about blowing up planets, but those are the two possibilities. So if you built the Death Star, do you rent it out because that's a strategy, or do you go blow up planets on your own? And everyone gets to make that choice, and that's a choice that B-School doesn't help you with. That I promise you. But if you're marketing yourself against B-School candidates or people who are out there in the real world, chances are they've learned more from books and less from life. Chances are, unless they're late-stage MBAs, in which case they're formidable components, uh, opponents. But a formidable opponent is what makes you awesome. Like, God bless every formidable opponent I've ever had in my life. And the ones who've beaten me are the best ones I know. And that's the way I have to think about it. And actually, I think that's a nice Yiddish cup way to look at life. Now, wait, wait, one second. Go. Renting versus owning. Sometimes you could work for somebody and make more money than being in your own business. So well, I'm not saying there's a right way or a wrong way. I'm renting not renting yourself out. It's just how do you monetize that? And for some people, you can work and yeah, you, know, you could work somewhere and make a lot of money and monetize it. I am absolutely not in any way disagreeing with that statement. I'm simply saying it's a choice. Here's a good question: How does one approach an idea so big? It would conservatively require a hundred million plus dollars in startup money before you could even show a proof of concept. I can't imagine anything that big, but if you can, how would you do it? Well, if you're Elon Musk and you're going to build a car company, uh, you approach it by making a hundred million first and putting it in yourself, because finding investors. Nice advice, Howard. <laughs> finding like investors uh, who will do it is pretty is pretty hard. Yeah, I, I really don't have much to add. I mean, if you have that that big idea, you aren't gonna f you, you just aren't gonna be able unless you've done it before. I mean, you've built, you know, from scratch a company that's worth you know billions of dollars. Then maybe you've got a shot at getting a lot of money early on from an investor, but that's the only possibility. Otherwise, you'll never get it. I don't think there's such an idea that even exists. Well. You have to wonder how they thought up FedEx and demonstrated it. Hi, I'm going to absolutely have it there by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning all over the United States. Somebody had to build that network, right? So you had to do a proof of concept. At some point, I can't imagine how they actually convinced someone to give them the amount of money they needed for FedEx, but it was a more naive time, I guess. Well, Mr. Fred Smith built FedEx with his own money. He didn't go make a $100 million IPO. There you go. So that I stand corrected. You need 100 million bucks. Whoever asked that question, you need 100 million bucks. Go get it first. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is nice. Where do you see the future of brick and mortar retail? There is no clear, straight answer, but it's in flux. There is always going to be a need for brick and mortar. Always. <laughs> <laughs> and for pickup for what you order yeah. online. That's for drones. Come on. Um, brick and mortar has, is changing dramatically. If you look at Best Buy, for example, uh, everybody thought that they were history, and they're making money. Um, they've changed their whole uh, way of doing business by having stores within the stores. And by basically... You're renting, they're renting out their uh, space. It becomes almost showroom like, so that you know that if you really want to buy something online, you really many times want to touch and feel the product. Even if you're talking to a sales associate who has no clue what he's talking about, you still want to go in there, touch, feel the product, and sometimes even buy it on the spot. And so, brick and mortar will always, always have some um, um, form and some need. There will always be a case for it. Although in 10 years, it will probably look very, very different than what it is today. Very different. And, and I think it depends on the product set. I mean, uh, in the f food space, uh, we're, we're investors in Blue Apron, which is doing very well. But 
you know, people want to go to restaurants for social reasons, so that's a brick and mortar business that'll that'll last. Uh, in many others, you, you, there's showrooming uh, that uh, that you mentioned is is happening already. People go in, and uh, some of the s smarter retailers like Prada uh, give you have iPads now, and you go in and you say, "Look, I saw this online," and the first thing they do is give you an iPad and it says, "Okay, this iPad will direct you to the to the rack that that particular dress is on." So you can go and find it inside the store after you've actually done some of the previous prior work online. But in terms of the mix between commerce that's e-tail versus brick and mortar, there's a long way to go before e-tail takes over brick and mortar. Uh, however, what Amazon has done is kind of revolutionary, which is when I want a piece of electronics today and it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and I go to Amazon Prime now, it can be at my house at 7 before I come home. I could have walked across Union Square and gone into Best Buy and picked it up, but that would take me 20 minutes. This way I spent five minutes online, and when I get home, it's there. So I don't need the brick-and-mortar store for that. For clothing, that's, there's a, and we see dozens of technology startups that want to show you how they can fit you perfectly online. None of them have really gotten there with, with the customers. Well, Howard, I think you're right. There, there's actually, a, a, it, it's very, it's very product line de um, dependent. How many people here subscribe to diaper services online? So the diaper business is about, um, it's at about 16 and a half or 17% subscription now. It's a perfect subscription product because you kind of know exactly how big the child's going to be. You can't stock up on the wrong size. You buy a certain amount. Kids use apparently six to eight diapers a day. Don't ask me how I know that, but I do. Um, here's the thing. Diapers are the entire driver for Toys R Us, diapers and formula. That's a gigantic retail driver. You load up the minivan once a week on Thursday nights, you're going to grab all the uh, diapers and formula you need for that week, and next week you're probably going to be in a different size. If you're not, you're half-sized out, and you're maybe going to blow one half a container of that stuff. They're brutally expensive. Now you figure out what a Quidzy, which is diapers now owned by Amazon, has done to that business, which is the most affluent, most electronically connected human beings in the world, millennials with babies, never have to walk into a Toys R Us, ever. Never have to walk into a drugstore, never, unless there's an emergency where they find themselves in a very funny place. They've taken feet across the door and dropped it by an entire group of millennials, connected millennials. So the question isn't really how soon will, uh, um, will that e-commerce change, you know, beat uh, brick and mortar. The question is really what changes are about to occur and what's the white space that as an entrepreneur you can look at and say consumer behaviors are being changed by empowered technologies, right? I have a quad core computer in my pocket that's connected, broadband connected to a network. And that empowers me to do certain things much more quickly and also allows me to do things in a, in a more uh, proactive way that is data driven. The data set becomes a currency and I've got a completely new value chain that's been created. Right, so the question about e-commerce to, to brick and mortar is much less about can you buy a suit online, because you can if you know what you're buying. Um, these blue shirts, I'm on TV of four days a week. Makeup gets on the collar at a certain point, it can't come out. I order these online from Brooks Brothers by like a dozen at a time. It's not that I, I just know what size it is, I know what it is, and I know it's going to last four or five weeks, and then there's nothing that can happen with the laundry that's going to get the makeup off the collar. So I never have to walk into a Brooks Brothers. But years ago, and I'm talking maybe only three years ago, that I had to go in every few weeks and place the order. could have done it by phone, but it wasn't in my mindset to do that. It's one button press. So that consumer behavior change is the most important part. It's not whether the retail store lives or dies. It's not whether the e-commerce lives or dies. And as an entrepreneur, your job is to find the white space in there and figure out what you can do about that behavior change. Because without the behavior change, uh, there's, no, there's nothing there's no opportunity. With the behavior change, there's nothing but opportunity. Uh, last question um, that I have here uh, is a great one. How soon do you see IoT reaching critical mass with consumers? Internet of things. Yeah, IoT is the internet of things. Internet of everything, connected um, devices. So I'm a bit jaded in this space because I lived through this once before in a previous generation at Apple when we were investing in home networks and devices connected inside the home. 
and the market never really took off. Um, I know there's a lot, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I bought a flat in Tel Aviv and I'm now designing it and I'm automating elements of it. And so I've invested a lot of time in investigating what's going on in home automation now. And so I think that um, there's a lot happening in home automation and I think some of that's gonna be real and persist and take over certain sections of the market. Um, and there's certain niches of Internet of Things, but this, I, I have to say I'm a bit skeptical about this grand market of Internet of Things um, being pervasive and, and happening because I've just seen it talked about so many times before that uh, it never really, and it really fizzled out pretty quickly. Eric, what, what do you, I mean, are you talking George Jetson's house that we're not going to see? Is that what you're definitely, like, how are you defining IoT in the what you well, don't Well, yeah, so happen? in the home automation space, you know, I talk with friends who've automated their homes and the ones who really invest in it, I think most of them complained that they, they over-invested. That it sure. Was, it was gross overkill. They don't use 80% of the functionality and uh, their children or their wives or their friends or, or their husbands get confused and can't figure out how to use things half the time. And the blinds go up at the wrong time of the day, and the dimmer doesn't work, and and and, and because they have to call some programmer to come fix it, and, and so they they get get mad and upset. But it extends beyond the home, of course. Internet of Things talks about, you know, factory automation, and um, and uh, I mean, we, I would I helped out a small incubator group of guys that that came out of the Shmona Time unit in the army in Israel. They had some ideas, and I said, oh, those are stupid ideas. Let's work on something more interesting, and I helped them work on a project for securing um, smart meters. You know, it's, the market's not quite fully taken off in smart meters, but one day it will, and th those things need to be secured and be be um, um, uh, secured from ha hacking and so on. So, um, I don't know. I, I Are you that bearish on, on industrial internet? and on No, 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 there, there's there's a lot of opportunities in the industrial, industrial automation and, and the connected things in industry. But, you know, people have been talking about, you know, CRT screen or, or, or displays on top of a refrigerator and heating things up in the right way and wrong way for years, and I don't believe that stuff, kind of stuff will ever happen. Uh, I, I'm here I'll differ Socratically in a, in a couple of ways. First of all, I agree on home automation. I started investing in home automation in 1984 and then in 1986, and you know, it, it's like the year of the network. There were like 10 years, but eventually it did happen. Uh, my friend texted me when he I said this year was my 36th CES, and my friend said, "Oh, so it must be your your ninth year of the network and your fourth year of VR, <laughs> because <laughs> the, it just everything takes so long." A home automation. We have ne I have six nests in my home in Villanova in Pennsylvania, so when my wife drives down there, now I can turn the heat on before she goes. So there's some uses. The big thing I see right now for the next few years is in, is factory and industrial. So I'm on John Deere's technical advisory board. We had a a, a meeting the other day, and one of the big notions was that the factory, internal to the factory, the amount of IoT is growing dramatically and really helping to, to streamline the movement of the stuff through the factory, the, the prognostics on the machines, all sorts of stuff like that. And in the industrial, I mean, you all see the GE ads for you know, measurement of engines and stuff. That's happening more and more. We have an investment in an Israeli company called Augury that measures with Johnson Controls heating uh, and air conditioning systems, anything with moving parts, rotating parts. So I, I think that's happening pretty pretty soon. I think the home automation, we'll see if Mark Zuckerberg's year, this year Mark Zuckerberg said he wants to cr have his home fully automated with AI like uh, Iron Man film, uh, like Jared the Butler in the Iron Man film. And he's gonna spend the year working on that. And so he may get further than people have gotten before. But that's the, the the real problem is not Mark saying it. It's making it easy enough for my wife to use because she hates the technologies and she'll use them when they're really good. TiVo was the first thing that she really took to and, and be loved for television. But home automation systems, she goes crazy when she can't change the nest or when the power goes out and the nest goes down. And the, it just it's just very, very tough. Haim, you have a position? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to disagree with everybody, but it's <laughs> hard. Um, for those of you who are making products, it's very, home automation, I think, is the next generation of opportunity. Um, if you're making products or selling products, it's a huge opportunity. I think what happened is, is, is that they went into overkill, and people said, well, I'm going to automate the whole thing from the blinds to the refrigerator to the oven and everything else, which I think most of it is just, it doesn't work. And people are really not interested in automating their life to that level. 
but there is a balance over there, and there are core things in home automation that are a huge opportunity today, whether it's security, um, fire alarms. There are those basics, those basic things that people want in their home today that if they can get their hands on it, understand how to use it in a plug-and-play way, where it's not overcomplicated, where the technology doesn't confuse them, it's a huge opportunity. And who here wouldn't want to know um, who's at their front door if someone's in the front of their front door without having to download or attach too many wires in your house. If it's simple plug and play, you want to have it. If, God forbid, your house is on fire, you want to know about it before um, you get home or before the neighbors see smoke from coming, out, coming out of the house. But if it means that you have to now buy some sophisticated hardware and start wiring the place up and connecting apps and mostly your to phones and tablets, most people will give up at that point. That's true. But there is a huge, huge, huge demand for very basic home automation. We can put in a plug on that for Ring.com, one of our companies that has a doorbell that sits outside with a camera. And when somebody rings the doorbell, it rings your iPhone. You see who's there. It's caught many burglars now. They, it's, it's, uh, they, they, they send the video to the police and say, so-and-so is trying to break in. So, it's, uh, so that's a good use. I think one thing you have to think about with IoT or Internet of Things, um, both industrial Internet and Internet at Home, is that this is not going to play out the way you think it's going to play out. Every single sensor that is made by Intel, by AMD, by NVIDIA, this, there's going to be so, about 50 billion of them deployed over the next few years, uh, is going to go in something. And the data sets that these create, these endpoints, are going to create data that's actionable by marketers and actionable by entrepreneurs. And it's making that data actionable. Whether I don't think George Jetson's house is a goal. I don't think there's a consumer value proposition there. But there certainly is in the sensors and the self-driving car lane on the Long Island Expressway. There certainly is in an industrial building where the building itself is made to come alive and take care of itself in an energy efficient way and, and run its own security. And then that data set is created. So I think there are a lot of opportunities around IoT in in the sources and uses of the data, the collecting of that data, and I would not look so much to the, oh, I'm going to make George and Judy Jetson's house a reality, because no one has proven, to Eric's point, has ever proven that that is something people actually want. Um, the doorbell thing is great. Ring has a thing. There's a company called Vivint, just really quickly. Vivint is another doorbell company. They learned something at CES, oh, they told me something at CES that made my whole CES work for me. Apparently, Vivint, it works the way Ring works. You press the doorbell, it, it, there's an app that opens up, and you get a two-way conversation with whoever's on the, uh, standing at your door. Turns out that little kids wanting to get their parents' attention would go outside and ring the doorbell to get their parents on the nap to talk to them. And I thought that was funny until I saw a video of a, uh, a German shepherd that had figured out that, well, that the kid can do what I can too. And the German shepherd would go outside and ring the doorbell and bark at the owner. And I thought this was the funniest <laughs> thing I'd ever seen in my life. Unin unintended consequences of technology. I'd like to thank the panel, uh, Howard, Eric, and Chaim. Thank you all very much for being here this evening. <laughs> Happy anniversaries. Good evening, everybody. This is my second event, and I had a phenomenal time. Do you guys agree? Yeah. Let's give them another round of applause. This was a phenomenal, phenomenal panel. I'd like to thank my partner, Yosef. Uh, phenomenal job in terms of putting this together. This was absolutely an event to, uh, to be here. Has everybody enjoyed the food, drink, camaraderie, and networking? Yeah. All right. Are we looking forward to doing this again next year? Oh, yeah. All right. The windows are there, but I would suggest that we build another room outside of the windows because I think it's going to be very, very packed here next year. What do you guys think? Yeah. All right. So on behalf of my partners at Deloitte, we thank you. We thank you. Please, as you think of entrepreneurship, please think of Deloitte. Once again, please enjoy drinks. We'll be here for a little bit longer. Thank you once again for coming. Take care, everybody. Thank you.